Welcome to another episode of Well, Don't Tell the Kids. I'm Janet Lee, your host, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Teresa Woodruff. I want to thank you very much for joining me today, Teresa. Happy to be here. Teresa joins us for a conversation from the Windy City of Chicago in Illinois. So I'm curious to know if you are a Midwesterner or if you are hail from some other part of our great country. No, I'm a Midwesterner. I grew up here uh, near Chicago and uh, did all of my graduate work at Northwestern where I Mm -hmm. serve on the faculty and uh, as dean of the graduate school now. So uh, lifelong, largely, uh, Midwesterner and Chicagoan. Yes, I wanted to congratulate you on your appointment as the new dean of the graduate school at Northwestern. Since just a few weeks here, how is that going? It's going great. I love graduate education, and I was able to welcome, you know, over about a thousand new incoming mm. graduate students, postdocs, uh, master students to Northwestern, and I was able to reflect on the fact that 32 years ago I was sitting in their seat, kind of wondering where I would go. You know, hopefully uh, my career path is a little bit of an example of what a Northwestern degree can do for you, and just very excited to be leading this initiative or this school at this time. I'd like to come back to that. So you earned your doctorate in biochemistry, as you mentioned, from Northwestern City. Um, Did you start with biochemistry um, at the undergraduate level, or how did you get interested in studying science? I I was always committed to being a first-grade teacher uh, up until (laughs) my uh, freshman year in college. Uh, My mother uh, was a first grade teacher, and my grandmother was a teacher on the prairies of western Oklahoma during the Dust Bowl, uh, where she taught all grades in uh, the typical one-room, two-room schoolhouses. And uh, so I loved and still do love teaching. Uh, That was really where I thought I would commit my, my life to teaching. My mom always said that first grade is the most transformative time of a person's life. And so, um, you know, that was my interest. And then when I got to college, I became uh, really interested in the sciences and trying to explore questions that people just didn't know the answers to. And in fact, I was interested in understanding how to ask questions um, that became the answers in the back of the book, and that led me down the the science area. And you completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Genentech after your, and can you just tell us a little bit about that research there? So, uh, yes, after my graduate degree at Northwestern in biochemistry, where I had discovered, uh, where I'd worked on the cloning of a new set of genes from the ovary, most uh, folks at the, in the late 80s would have gone directly into an academic postdoc. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, the rise of biotechnology in the uh, 80s led me towards uh, that new industry, largely because that's where the tools were that, I needed to answer the next question that I was interested in solving uh, out of my PhD work. And so took rather an unorthodox turn at the time, and now that's clearly a career path that many people take out of a PhD, but at the time it was very unique. Uh, from that experience, I really learned uh, how science could really be immediately transformative to patients, and that was an uh, important imprint on my own professional career as I then decided to move back to the academy. Immediately transformative for the patient, huh? So can you just give us an example of that? I'm just trying to connect that a little bit closer to Well, at, you know, bio, in, biotech and pharma are responsible for the production of most of the drugs that we take. And mm-hmm. at the time, Genentech was working on drugs like tissue plasminogen activase, which is used even today for stroke and and heart attack. It was, uh, you know, making many of the recombinant drugs. They were produc- producing the recombinant insulin that was ultimately sold by Lilly and other places. So you could really see how the power of genetic material, of molecular biology, of recombinant drugs would actually move forward and then um, uh, be important for, for patient care. And um, as the dean, just shifting back to my other path, what do you see as Well, maybe you can describe how you see the role of the dean of the graduate school and what do you think is the most significant priority for you in that role? Well, that's a big question, but of course uh, (laughs) that's what the role demands. And so I think the most important thing is that the dean of the graduate school is really uh, over the graduate school 
students from all schools. So mm -hmm. unlike the dean of an individual school where you're really digging deep into engineering or music or communication or law, the dean of the graduate school really uh, is horizontal across mm -hmm. all, in our case, 12 schools of Northwestern. So I want to make sure that every student is receiving kind of the, the quality education, has a learning environment in which they can transition from undergraduate into you know, postgraduate work, uh, is able to do the kind of creative uh, or um, uh, analysis of existing text or of art, or can really do the next generation of discoveries that will be tomorrow's medicine. And mm -hmm. ensuring that the environment from the perspective of the student is right is one part of my goal, and the other is to ensure that our faculty have the highest quality, highest caliber students uh, who can engage with them in that transformational work. And uh, so it's, I see it as really a bipartite uh, community consumer group for the school, and I really look forward to, to leading on a number of different initiatives. I'm an alum from there, so I see from my vantage point, there's actually some, a lot of activity with the international campus. Can you speak to that at all? Yeah, Qatar is, uh, is the international campus for Northwestern, mm -hmm. a place where we've largely built in the School of Journalism. And we just opened a school in San Francisco as a thick but non-Evanston, Chicago tethered site. And I think that's what uh, Northwestern really sees its brand as valuable. And it's not just the, the brand, the word. It is mm -hmm. that the kind of uh, education that we provide is of a quality that can be uh, enormously useful for people from around the globe. And we have a large international population of undergraduates, graduate students, and faculty. And so being able to deliver in a globally engaged way is important. Kellogg under Sally Blount mm -hmm. has done a tremendous job of uh, making sure that Kellogg faculty are teaching whether in Hong Kong or India or, or wherever. And I think in a globally engaged world, we have the ability and I think the responsibility to provide education in a borderless way. Um, mm -hmm. That geography shouldn't matter to one's mm -hmm. ability to access education. And so that's uh, one of the things that I really love about Northwestern's vision and really endorse that global engagement that uh, we've already seen and I think we'll be building on for the future. Shifting gears, though you wear many, many hats, but one of them is you're the founder and director of the Women's Health Research Institute at Northwestern and that's housed downtown in um, the Feinberg School of Medicine. So uh, how old is this institute and what caused you to create this um, organization to begin with? Well, uh, this is uh, the 10th year of the Women's mm -hmm. Health Research Institute, so we're celebrating a real milestone for the uh, initiatives that we started 10 years ago, some of which we, uh, I, I noticed as one of the um, big issues that we had in our clinical work is that there was an absence of women in clinical studies and so wanted mm. to make sure that females were present as participants in all clinical studies. And sometimes we think of women as really just uh, breast cancer or babies, and mm. I think there's a lot beyond the bees. And uh, so we wanted to make sure that women were participants in trials that had to do with cardiovascular disease, with kidney failure, with muscle, skeletal muscle issues. And so one of our prime goals was to uh, initiate an Illinois Women's Health Registry that allows hmm. women who really want to and are actively interested in participating in clinical studies to have access uh, to those studies and for uh, clinical coordinators to be able to have a group of ready and willing participants. In addition, um, I was very concerned about the fact that basic or fundamental science was largely based on male animals mm. and male cells. And so wanted to begin and you know, amplify on work that I had done even before founding the Women's Health Research Institute. The, what we were really missing out on as a, uh, as a consumer of, uh, of medical innovation that comes from fundamental science, if we continued to have an, uh, this disparity between male and females represented at the earliest mm -hmm. stages of, of science. And so uh, last, uh, last year, two years ago, I guess, we're celebrating the second uh, birthday of the NIH policy that we were very uh, engaged in um, advocating for at the level of uh, Congress and then NIH. 
um, such that uh, all NIH federally funded investigators must include the consideration of sex as a biological variable. And you might think that that just seems like the most obvious thing on the planet. Uh, yeah. But uh, in fact, it required a lot of effort and a lot of work. And in fact, we're celebrating the second anniversary of this, of this I think, really landmark um, mm. policy change. And if I had a crystal ball and said, what will we see uh, in the next 10 years, uh, I would say that there will be a before and an after January mm. 25th, 2016, when this law was enabled because of the inclusion of sex as a biological variable. So, in fact, on January 25th, 2018, we will be mm -hmm. celebrating the second birthday with a big uh, event at Northwestern, and everyone's encouraged to go to the WHRI website, and you can see the information on what we call sex cells, S-E-X-C-E-L-L-S, -E -L -L -S, so sex mm -hmm. cells, uh, 2018. <laughs> and uh, that's going to be um, a way to kind of keep tabs on where the breakthroughs are occurring and make sure NIH knows how uh, important that policy was and also demonstrate whether or not the implementation and take up is what we hope and expect. Um, I spoke with Dr. Wojtovich and she touched upon your work here. What do you see as the, the obstacles in the past to that or maybe that's current still? Going on. Well, part of it is just that science builds on past science. So mm -hmm. there was just a, a, a field effect of new investigators not deviating from the way folks had done it in the past. And there's also mm -hmm. this uh, kind of myth that many people think that the hormone cycles of the female uh, cause variation in the data. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time they say that there's variation, they also say, well, whatever I learn in the male is good for the female. And mm -hmm. so those myths really combined led to the paucity of information on sex in science. And I think what that led to then is a very slow pathway to uh, clinical utility. And mm -hmm. many drugs failed because of adverse events in women. And if you trace that back, you probably had many places along the pipeline mm -hmm. where if you simply understood the impact of the drug, either on males or females, you could have actually had a better drug a better dose, a better time, uh, mm -hmm. and in some cases you simply wouldn't deliver that drug to some individuals because of their sex. And I think that cuts both ways, both for males and females, but simply put, the, mo the majority of the adverse events are in females, and that you would predict to be the case if the mm -hmm. entire pipeline is male predicated. So this represents the biggest no-brainer on earth. Uh, everyone should get on board with this. The public should be very excited about this. And you know, I mm -hmm. urge everyone to ask their doctor when they're prescribed a drug, was this drug tested on me? And the promise mm -hmm. of really basic science and medicine is that tomorrow's patient will be treated better than today's. And so mm -hmm. my hope is that by this and many other initiatives, we can see in 5 and 10 and 20 years a real impact on the health of every one of us. A milestone I really hope that grows and benefits. I also need to congratulate you on being named the recipient of a 2017 Guggenheim Fellowship. Oh, yes, Congra thank you. Congratulations. I'm really excited about that, yes. Uh, let's see, I have a quote, but maybe you can just tell us about what you're hoping to study and what you're hoping the significance will be. Yeah, for the Guggenheim, I was really just delighted to be named a Guggenheim Fellow. It's mm. uh, certainly a group of scholars that has a long and storied history and generally are not scientists, <laughs> mostly in the <laughs> arts and humanities. And they mm. select just a couple of science projects each year uh, where they think that they will have broad impact. And so I'm, I'm really just honored to be a, a Guggenheim Fellow. The project that I'm doing really has to do with global germ cell health. Uh, and again, on the female side, we know, well, the, our project, my project is on the female side. Mm. We know a lot about male health, male reproductive health, primarily mm. from the perspective of the sperm. And we know that mm -hmm. sperm count and quality is going down around the globe. We have no similar accounting of the quality of the female germ cell around the globe. And um, that's what we're going to try and, and uh, look at from the human uh, to uh, animals in the wild around the globe and ultimately to um, corals uh, and broadcast fertilizers. The last was really where we were starting with our coral reefs mm -hmm. and our uh, fertilization of corals. Uh, because we thought we could really sample and see what the uh, differences would be across um, uh, global mm -hmm. communities. But, uh, you know, the hurricane season has uh, mm -hmm. really disrupted that, so we're not going to be able to do that this year as we expected. Hopefully we'll get that done next year, and 
uh, we'll be putting into place some of these other germ cell banks along the way. So it's a really exciting project, and uh, even more than that, it's really an honor to be named with all these course, other Guggenheim yeah. scholars who are really just incredible intellectuals yeah. and leaders for our nation. Okay, I'm uh, curious about the coral. So you're going to have to tell me why coral, and aren't coral reefs falling on hard times? Yes, in some Without. cases they're they're gone. You know, they're mm. really getting they're having a hard time. You know, off the coast of Australia, other places mm. they're still thriving. So there are corals at the mid tropical zone around the globe, and so that was that represented a good opportunity to kind of look at corals in different settings. It represents a difficult part of the project. I think it would be very neat if we could do it, but you know, our first uh, start at this was uh, in Florida and in the Caribbean, and mm, of course that, okay. and uh, the fertilization only occurs, you know, once a year, and so we've uh, yeah. largely lost that opportunity for this year and this cycle, so uh, I know there'll be a lot of recovery of people mm. and place and houses on terrestrial parts of our uh, great country and in the right. Caribbean nations, and uh, our heart goes out to them, and mm. of course we're continuing to send support in many different ways. Uh, yeah. But our also hope is that the underground, uh, the underwater uh, communities can can recover um, mm -hmm. from all of this uh, churn that occurs mm -hmm. within the water as much as on land. And so uh, we'll be uh, working on that probably in the next year. So any advice to the young, especially women, who would like to get into STEM fields and advance through there? There's a lot of challenges, of course, and you've faced them and overcome them. Um, well, I think the key is to just have a vision of yourself in the future uh, and to then just uh, just go and do it. There are a lot of obstacles for everyone in every single yeah. field. And so women are best enabled to answer some of the world's and humans' most perplexing problems. And uh, they look at the world and they look at problems in different ways, which is why I think diversity matters in the workplace, not just mm -hmm. in the sciences but beyond. And mm -hmm. because of that, they'll have unique takes on, on questions that can be asked in, in the, at the bench. And so it's really critical that we don't opt out before the opportunity to kind of learn and discover. And sometimes when we hit uh, a little snag in the road, we, we kind of stop and stumble, and, and, and that stumble turns into, uh, you know, I'm going to leave rather than course correct. Mm -hmm. And there certainly are downward pressures. There are external pressures. There are lots of ways that um, the system is trying to – you know, weed out um, the mm. many into the final few. And my sense is that women should be part of that final few. Uh, where we mm. see, uh, again putting my hat on as dean, where we see the first major drop in women in the, uh, in the tracking towards the academy is between graduate school and postdoc. So we're okay. giving out about as many PhDs to males and females, but the majority of uh, individuals who persist who go on to a postdoc, which is necessary towards you know taking the next mm. step into the academy, for example, being me essentially. Mm. That's where we see the very first precipitous drop. People talk about the leaky pipeline, where there's a little bit of a leak along the way mm. from assistant professor to full professor, and then of course to um, academic leadership, like being a dean or a provost or a president. Well. Mm. The drip that you see as part of the pipeline is nothing compared to the gusher that you see in PhD and postdoc. And so one of my main initiatives is to really try and make sure that as many individuals as possible make the transition between the PhD to the postdoc in order mm -hmm. to make sure that the pipeline is as open and free as possible. And, and that's really an important part of uh, really looking at data and being able to use it in a way that can course correct. Hmm, interesting. I wonder if that points to a systemic set of obstacles that you're going to try to address. You know, during that time is when, in most professions, uh, men and women are starting families. And so mm -hmm. we know that, and that is the case for, for all of us. There's no mm -hmm. age difference that we can do. So we just have to make sure women know that, that there is there's every reason that they can succeed. And sometimes there is this uh, false uh, hypothesis that is put out that there is mm -hmm. this thing called life versus work, this life-work uh, balance. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a false preposition. I think that it's all life. If you say work is something different than my life, then in fact you're compartmentalizing in a way that is 
that will, huh. in fact, le- lead to failure. I teach a high school program where we bring in high school girls from the city of Chicago every mm. summer to a series of lab activities. And I had a 14-year-old girl raise her hand at the end of the session where everybody was so excited and enthusiastic, had learned a lot, were ready and ready to go back out. And I, I opened it up for general questions, and one 14-year-old raised her hand and said, well, you know, I really like science, but what's this you know, thing about work-life balance? I'm really afraid I'm not going to be able to make it. And I looked at her and I said, you're 14. You mm. don't need to worry about this. And this is where I really began to think that the issue of work-life balance is a meme of society that is itself mm. insidiously keeping women down because women believe it. And the number of times that people ask about this represents more wasted time because mm. if you just would focus on what the metrics are for success and working the amount of time you need and going home and having the family that you want, I think that in the end we would have more women uh, and, uh, in the pipeline. And so that's my message to young women. You can do it and you should want to do it. Opting out is one of the things that is certainly uh, an issue. Now, that has to be balanced with the fact that there is a lot of downward pressure on women. There are who are going to say a lot of demeaning things. Uh, and you do have to be uh, resilient to those things. And, you know, sometimes uh, women will make a small mistake and, again, make it too big. Others will say something that you think then they magnify and remember for years, and they never Mm -hmm. do. And so I think we both have to correct the environment, but we also have to correct ourselves. We have to start thinking about work as life, not life versus work. And if we can make that little course correction, I think we're going to have a big change in our, in our professional fields. And I hope to do that uh, with our graduate students at Northwestern. So I'm in the, near the nation's capital, and I, there's an, a lot of museums. And so I was in a modern art one, and there was an exhibition set up by a dissident. There were a lot of words involved with this art. But it, one of them, the quote, his quote was, life is art. Art is life, and I do not try to separate them. So ah, well, I, that's kind of I'm what I'm tra- saying. You just reminded me of that, yeah. That, My feeling mm-hmm. is that the question of the work-life balance is an inappropriate dialectic. So we have to get away from that in order to take the next step. And it is a cultural meme if a 14-year-old is already thinking about that and mm-hmm. already saying to herself, I can't succeed because of this thing. And so if we can really think about that, I think that will be a big, big change for the future. In Northwestern Now, in the May issue of 2017, uh, Kristen Samuelson wrote a piece called 3D Printed Ovaries Produce Healthy Offspring. And she must have interviewed you. And you noted that this was the holy grail of bioengineering for regenerative medicine. Can you just tell us a little bit about that and why you characterize it as the holy grail? And what does that mean for women in the future? This project was one that we began some years ago because I've been interested in uh, restoring fertility to young patients with cancer. And Mm -hmm. I coined the term oncofertility about 11 years ago in order to address the unmet need of females in particular who who would have the same uh, hope for surviving their cancer but were not being offered fertility-sparing options in the same way that men were. So men could bang sperm and women were told, we'll just deal with cancer. And I think that represented a disparity that was really an, um, uh, an impossible one. And mm-hmm. I was the basic science director for the Lurie Cancer Center at Northwestern and appreciated that young 14- and 15-year-old boys were coming to our adult center to bank sperm, but mm-hmm. women with that same hope for survival weren't being offered any intervention. And mm-hmm. so oncofertility is now recognized as a medical discipline. It, ha- it is a field where we have patient navigators. We have basic science that is uh, impacting the pipeline of options for the future. So one of the things that we've been doing throughout the course of this work is to try and engineer an ovarian mimetic that could be transplanted back primarily for pediatric mm-hmm. cancer patients in order to restore ovarian function. And so many young pediatric girls will be sterilized by their cancer treatment and cannot make it through puberty without exogenous hormones. And Mm. so we wanted to create a 3D printed ovary. And it turns out that the part of that quote, which is the holy grail part, uh, Mm. is because no one had been able to 3D print or a soft tissue structure Mm. that was functionalized and could be functional in vivo. And so that... uh, ovary really heralds a whole new area for the potential of tissue transplant from liver to kidney Mm -hmm. to heart to other organs. 
And it's really cool that the ovary is leading the way. And so I was quite excited about that, uh, that outcome. The ovary is leading the way, as with most things in life. So that's about all the time that we have for now. And uh, I wanted to thank you, Teresa. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you all for listening. My guest today has been Dr. Teresa Woodruff, and I'm Janet Lee. Please stay tuned for more episodes of Well, Don't Tell the Kids. Thank you.